if you're setting out with ten thousand dollars for an around the world trip you can make that last a whole year if you go to the right places but if you just go to western europe or even to africa because of the distances you're gonna use that up a lot faster Welcome to Deviate with Rolf Potts, where I talk with experts, public figures, and interesting people about fascinating topics that meander off topic. Today, I more or less break the premise of my podcast, since in this discussion of the cheapest destinations in the world and why it's so cool to travel to those places, I don't really deviate from the central premise, in part because this is such useful travel advice. My guest for this conversation is Tim Leffel, who released the first edition of his book, The World's Cheapest Destinations, back around the same time I released my own book, Vagabonding. World's Cheapest Destinations is now in its fifth edition, so Tim and I roll up our sleeves and jump straight into its premise. That is, the notion that traveling for months at a time overseas can be as cheap or cheaper than living at home in any major American city. Now, any salty backpacker will tell you that this manner of travel has never really been a secret, but somehow the strategy of building a vagabonding journey around the cheaper parts of the world has never been properly embraced by your average traveler. In addition to a broad discussion of what less expensive countries have to offer, we also talk about specific itineraries for regions like Asia and Latin America and Europe, itineraries that I hope will generate ideas for your own journeys. This is the kind of vagabonding 101 type conversation that I don't typically have in this podcast, but even as an experienced traveler, I learned things from this conversation about places like Albania, Nepal, and Kyrgyzstan that will probably inspire future travels of my own. For now, please enjoy this one hour conversation about the strategies and joys involved in traveling to the world's cheapest destinations. I traveled to a lot of the countries that you put in your book not because your book had been out yet, because it wasn't, but because those were the places I could afford, right? So there's there's a backpacker assumption that underlies your book, but it feels like maybe your book, since it first came out in 2002, uh, is finding an audience that might not know that they can travel for a fraction of it would co- what it would cost in a more expensive part of the world. So how did you find yourself doing, doing uh, travel in cheaper parts of the world? Yeah, for me, it was uh, sort of born out of experience. I spent three years backpacking around the world with my then girlfriend at first, now wife, and we could not find that kind of information very easily at that point, and well, especially pre-internet, but even after the web started, it was difficult to find reliable information on prices, and so I sort of put out the book that I wished I'd had, and it was aimed mostly at backpackers at the beginning because I figured that's who would be buying it. And there still are a lot of people setting off on a around the world trip that use this to kind of plan out their itinerary to figure out what they can afford. But I also started aiming it more to, I guess you'd say mid range travelers or flashbackers, even people that have a little more money to spend. Um, because still there's definitely an appeal to going on vacation to a place where you can get a lot more for your money too. And so I found having a blog helps for this. I found through comments and emails and whatever that a lot more older travelers, even retirees were buying the book. So I've tried to appeal to a wider audience, but I'm still focused on where the real values are as a backpacker or as someone who's you know got a couple hundred bucks a day to spend well i think that's the secret well we can expand on that in a second but just being willing to be even if you can afford uh more of a flash packer lifestyle being able to to forgo a few of those comforts not just to save money but to have a more interesting experience and um we can get to we'll get to country by country specifics in a second because i think my listeners can almost use this as a menu for for where to start in certain parts of the world or at least where to take their little travel nest egg and uh, and really get more for what they thought they would get out of their nest egg than they than they realized and i think that there's there's sort of an assumption in this in the us that we start in a place like you know france or germany or or you know a place that just simply costs a lot more Cost aside, price savings aside, what are the advantages of of traveling in cheaper parts of the world? Yeah, I think there are a lot of advantages beyond the price. Uh, Partly, 
these places don't tend to be as crowded. I mean, if you go to the Balkans or Eastern Europe, you're not going to find as many people as you would in France or Italy or England. So that's one advantage there. You're maybe not going to be fighting as many crowds and tour buses because uh, they aren't as famous. I mean, of course, everybody knows the pyramids of Egypt or the Taj Mahal or even Angkor Wat these days. But once you get away from those main attractions, those countries, even Peru, tend to be much, much less crowded. So that's one advantage. I do feel like you get you just have a lot more fun when your dinner is $10 instead of $100, I think. <laughs> or when you go out to have a few beers and they're a buck or two instead of, you know, 12 or $15 that you'd spend in Norway. I just think you have a more enjoyable time. And you don't have to make so many tough choices. You can go on whatever activities you want and go to the, you know, see the attractions or go to museums or whatever without breaking your budget. And I think that maybe makes your trip a little less stressful, gives you less to argue about if you're with a significant other. <laughs> I think, too, it allows you to take that that money, say $10,000 or whatever, which might last you a month or two in the expensive countries of Europe, and then take it – and you can just buy yourself more time uh, in these cheaper parts of the world. For sure. I mean, if you're if – you're, setting out with $10,000 for an around the world trip, you can make that last a whole year if you go to the right places. But if you just go to Western Europe or even to Africa because of the distances, you're going to use that up a lot faster. You don't have a lot of Africa chapters in your book, uh, but it, it feels almost like Africa is the place you go when, you, when you're salty in other parts of the world. What's, what's your take on Africa? <laughs> Yeah, I agree. The people there seem to be either super experienced travelers or people that are just going for a two-week safari vacation. Um, there doesn't seem to be much middle ground. It seems like all the middle ground is occupied by NGO workers and volunteers and whatever. So it's a weird place in a lot of ways. The weird continent. I've tried really hard to include more countries, and I've interviewed so many people that have done extensive trips there. And they all come back saying, you know, Africa is just not much of a bargain. <laughs> it's partly because it's so far from point to point and partly because there's just not as much of a backpacker infrastructure as you find in Southeast Asia, for example, where, you know, there's a hundred cheap hotels to choose from almost everywhere you go. Yeah, it's it's a different, I, I, you know, bargains can be had. But, you know, I, I think of a couple winters ago, I was in Mozambique, and I got some great prices there that you can travel on a budget in Mozambique. But really, I was using my travel ninja skills from Southeast Asia, you know, with, without having had my experience of and my instincts sharpened by other parts of the world, it would have been tough for me to be a budget traveler in Mozambique. And to be honest, I rented a four by four there. That was sort of a you know, a Rolf in his 40s thing rather than a Rolf in his 20s thing. I don't think I would have done that. And I think Mozambique would just have been tougher if I was going from bus to bus than if I had put forth that money on the rental car and then saved money because I could get around. Yeah, I feel like you, you almost have to do something like that to rent a vehicle or you have to book an overland adventure trip with somebody like G Adventures or Intrepid or someone to – that's going to work out all the logistics for you. <laughs> um, or you fly a lot, you know, we're talking, of course, if you're going to more than one country, but if you're going to fly all that way, it seems kind of criminal to only go to one country. Well, people forget how big Africa is too. You know, I was in South, I had two or three months there and I was in South Africa and I wanted to go to Namibia, but I didn't have time to go overland to Namibia and it doesn't cost much. So, uh, so I flew into Swakopmund from, from Johannesburg and again, I I, uh, I didn't spend a lot of money in Namibia, but I had a rental car there too. So I, I sort of there's certain cheats that apply to Africa. So I think, you know, I think maybe the the market for your book, you can correct me if I'm wrong, are people who haven't done this extensively and they sort of want a menu of options for transitioning into that cheaper way of traveling. Yeah, of course. I mean, I'll get the odd snide review sometimes where somebody goes, "Oh, I could have found all this myself on the internet." And you know, it kind of defeats the purpose. Of course you can. Um, you know, you could find everything in any book if you are willing to spend 30 or 40 hours on it. But the idea is you spend uh, 10 bucks and it's all there in front of you. Yeah, it is the sort of wisdom that you could find in accumulated copies of Lonely Planet 20 years ago. Um, 
and you've sort of centralized it. One more thing before we get to some specifics. Um, how does traveling cheaper make for a better experience sometimes than if you were insulating yourself with, uh, with uh, more expensive options? Well, I think any backpacker will tell you that they spend a lot more time with locals than the uh, high money tourists do. <laughs> you know, they are actually interacting with people who live there and seeing more of the day to day life of, of the people of that country and, or that city. And I think that's really important. And from a sustainability standpoint, you're, you're leaving a lot more of your money in the local community. If you stay at a, you know, a Marriott in Cancun, you know, maybe there's a trickle down effect. There are people who work there and they're happy to have that job, but it's not the same as if you go out and stay in Valladolid or even Merida and actually spend money in local restaurants and stay at a locally owned hotel and go on, you know, go out on an excursion with a locally owned tour company. It just, you end up, uh, benefiting the local economy and real people a lot more, I think. And just it's a more gratifying experience than being carted around from place to place and only getting that surface experience. You have to figure things out on your own and interact with people, and that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It feels like you're traveling in local economies. You're more likely to stay in mom-and-pop hotels. You're more likely to, to use the same routes that the local middle class uses on their vacations. And uh, – it really is. It's it's funny. They have, I've seen articles now about experiential travel where you'll you'll pay for a tour that will take you and give you exposure to local communities. And I I'm kind of scratching my head because it feels like the stuff that backpackers are doing already. <laughs> I know. I was just going to mention that because I've noticed that too. The whole experiential travel trend is basically um, you're going to spend eight hundred dollars a day to do what backpackers have been doing all along. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, let's let's get some frames of reference so people can can wrap their head around this because some people listening might not have considered being a backpacker and may consider themselves too old to be a backpacker perhaps. And so let's just let's get a frame of reference for how you can save money and how if you sort of take out the middleman mentality, then you can just be saving spending for example less money than it would cost to just live your normal life at home. So what are some examples of how living overseas can be cheaper than your life at home? So in a lot of the cheapest destinations around the world, it's very easy for a couple to get a hotel for 8, 10, 15 dollars a night. That's a private room for two, usually with its own bathroom. And if you go and look at what you spend for rent and divide it by 30, you're definitely spending a lot more <laughs> than than that per day. And then if you're in a place where restaurant meals are a few dollars and, you know, you can go out for a, a drink for a couple of dollars and you can go to a museum for 50 cents, then, you know, it does cost you a whole lot less than just your daily life at home. And there's a lot of things you take out of the mix if you're able to put things in storage or sell your car or, you know, get rid of the uh, various insurance bills you're paying. You know, people don't realize how much they actually spend on their car. It's normally 600 to $1,000 a month when you add up insurance and maintenance and everything else. So when you take those things out of the mix, you can really have a budget of, you know, $1,500 a month, let's say, or $2,000 a month for a couple and live a quite a nice, comfortable life on the road, but you know, you're carrying everything with you. You're staying maybe in modest places that aren't as fancy as your house at home was, but you end up finding out over time that maybe you didn't need that whole house worth of stuff as much as you thought you did. Yeah. It doesn't bring you the sort of satisfaction that a trip like this can. And in a second, we'll go region by region and, and sort of throw out some uh, some estimated monthly expenses, which might surprise people. And speaking of surprising people, uh, why don't you explain some of these $10 hotel rooms? Because I'm sure some people are thinking, oh, yeah, well, there's axe murderers and bed bugs. I mean, I'm not going to spend $10 on a hotel. But if you've been to these places, you realize that you can ha stay pretty comfortably for that sort of price. So what are some reassurances that you can give people about these super cheap sounding parts of the world where you're staying and staying cheap and sleep and eating cheap. Yeah. Well, if you've only traveled in the U S yeah, if you think of cheap hotel, you think of some ratty roadside place that's uh, maybe got 
shady drug dealers and prostitutes in the hallways or whatever. But uh, most parts of the world, people don't earn nearly as much money as an American or Canadian or Brit does. And hotel prices kind of adjust to that. And especially if they're areas that are serving a lot of backpackers, there's going to be a huge number of hotels that are reasonably priced for that crowd. So a lot of times these will be very nice, clean places. I mean, sometimes you can spend 15 or $20 and be in a place that's got a, uh, someone to carry your luggage and a elevator and a swimming pool. And it doesn't mean it's grotty. It just means it's, uh, you know, a, a budget hotel. It's just not uh, fancy. It's not a chain hotel. It's just some locally owned mom and pop place. And I've gotten um, some really nice places that I would have, that I've posted pictures of on social media and gone, Hey, here's my $12 room <laughs> because people really don't believe it. But, you know, sometimes you'll have an amazing view and uh, it'll be a fun atmosphere with other travelers. Maybe there's a roof deck or something like that. So, uh, I think people are happily surprised when they get to, say, Vietnam or Thailand or even places in Central America, how much they can actually get for their money. I think the last one that was super cheap when I was out on my own, I got a place in Nicaragua that was $6 a night and it had air conditioning in its own bathroom. And, you know, it's not it's not that it means you're sleeping with rats and bed bugs. It just means the local economy prices their places, what, whatever the market will bear for them. Yeah. I was in uh, Sumatra this winter. I stayed in a hotel on Lake Toba, which is just a mind blowingly beautiful volcanic lake. Oh yeah. It's gorgeous there. Yeah. And it was like, depending on where you stay, you know, the, you're paying like 12 bucks to, or, or, and then eight bucks if you can really bargain your way down, you know, it's just, it's just, it's nothing. I mean, especially compared to how you live back home. Um, and I'm yeah. curious. I'm curious to know, just again to reassure people, um, what is the crime and safety situation internationally? Because I find myself oftentimes sort of steering people to U.S. crime statistics, which can be scarier sometimes than international ones. So, what do you tell people when they ask you about the safety of these cheap parts of the world? Yeah, I tell them two things. First of all, realize that if you watch U.S. cable news, um, it's meant to be as sensationalist as possible to keep people watching. And you're only going to hear about another country if something bad's going on. You don't hear about it the whole rest of the time when things are normal. Um, and also, watch your own local news for a week and then tell me um, that your own hometown is perfectly safe. I think... Uh, People are not putting it in perspective most of the time. I mean, this is coming from a guy who lives in Mexico. So the first thing everybody asks me is, is it safe? Are there cartels in your town? <laughs> you know, have you been shot at? And, and all these things. And I feel much safer where I live there than I d did in Tampa, Florida, because, yeah, the crime statistics are scary. You know, we have these random shootings all the time. And that happens almost nowhere else in the world with any kind of frequency. So I think you're much more likely to get actually killed <laughs> in the U.S. You might be more likely to get uh, robbed at 3 a.m. if you're walking around um, some foreign city. But in general, uh, the hot spots are pretty well known. The places to stay away from are pretty well known, just as they are in your own city. So it's not that hard to stay out of trouble. I think I've been traveling for 25 years now, and I think the worst that I've ever had happen was a camera stolen out of my backpack. I mean, it just, uh, it's not something I worry about. Yeah, and, and you're in Guanajuato, Mexico, too, which I think sometimes when when we hear about dangerous places in Mexico, oftentimes it's border towns, which are often the first place we see as Americans, and so that's sort of the stereotype. Um, but so statistically, like Guanajuato is is not any more dangerous than Atlanta or, or Denver or someplace like that? No, not city-wise. And actually, if you compare Mexico City to our capital, Washington, D.C., then Mexico City comes out better. I mean, there's always arguments about how, you know, if everything's reported in the same consistent way or not. But still, um, if you just look at the actual official numbers, there's a, a pretty – it looks pretty bad for the U.S. And then we have cities like New Orleans and St. Louis and Detroit that are just, you know, horrendous if you look at the statistics or Chicago. So um, – but again, if you're a person living – in the loop in Chicago or living in the suburbs, you don't think it's a bad place to live because you're not in those neighborhoods. And 
I think the same is true in Mexico. If you're not in a border town or a port city or you're not mixing it up with the kinds of people that are shooting at each other, then you're probably going to be okay. Well, it's that good common sense. You know, you don't, when you, when you live in Denver or Chicago, you're not hanging out with, uh, well, you're not staggering around drunk at three in the morning, you know, in a neighborhood that you don't know. So exactly. Speaking of common sense, there's a certain common sense that, that attaches itself to this budget travel because, you know, I love Paris. I've been there a lot, of, you know, every summer for the past 15 years. But you sit down for dinner with a with a friend, and by the time you get wine, you're looking at maybe 45 euros at the very least for two people. Um, so what can you get for that, for the price of one meal in Paris? What can you get in a place like Indonesia or India or other affordable parts of the world, like even Egypt? Yeah, in many of those places, you would have trouble spending 45 euros. You would have to find the best place in town, probably in a hotel, and order to your heart's content. <laughs> a lot of places like Indonesia, a lot of those islands, you could eat for a week on 45 euros, with, and that's eating out every time. It's not cooking for yourself. So I think that's the big difference. It's You can't find a meal for 3 or $4 in Paris at a restaurant, but in many parts of the world, that's a normal restaurant meal price. Even even if you head down to Mexico or Guatemala, places that are pretty close, you can get a meal of the day for that amount of for three or four dollars, which is three courses and something to drink. It's a big lunch. You'll be stuffed. You have to go take a siesta. So it's right. a it's a major difference in what you're spending. And if you do want to splurge, we've been laughing here in Montana. Uh, we've been traveling around in the U.S. for a bit uh, the past few weeks. And what we spend just going out to a normal little sandwich place or pizza place or something like that is what we would spend at the fanciest ho- at the fanciest restaurant in town where we live in Mexico. I mean, that's if we go out and have you know multiple courses and, and a couple of drinks each. We'll maybe spend fifty dollars. It's kind of hard. It takes some effort. Yeah, and that's after a while you get used to it, and it can seem sort of strange. So. Uh, what are some other big picture things, in, in, including going to cheaper parts of the world? What are some other factors that can, big picture factors that can help you save money, like um, like uh, seasonal types of travel, booking as you go, uh, slowing down? What are some other big picture strategies that can help you save money? Yeah, slowing down is the biggest one, and I know that's you know a big uh, a big point of yours in in Vega bonding. I think. When you move quickly, you end up spending a whole lot more money just because you're spending money on transportation every day. And you're not in a place long enough to really get a feel for where the deals are. You know, where are those great $3 lunches or um, what is the right price to pay for a taxi to go across town? It's just so if you're in a place even for a few days, you get a feel for all of that and you end up spending less over time. And and just it's such a blur when you're moving from place to place every day. I, I don't feel like you get the same kinds of memories either. But from a pure economic standpoint, you're just giving a lot of your money to bus companies and train companies and, and airlines when you could be spending it on uh, enjoyable activities. But um, the pay-as-you-go thing, I think um, that's an interesting one because – especially young travelers I meet are so used to doing everything online that they kind of panic if they haven't had time to book their hotel ahead of time. But I'm sure you remember in the old pre-internet days, you just showed up and found a place and it wasn't any big deal. And you can still do that. And sometimes you can get a better price because the hotel's not having to spend a 25% commission for booking.com or Expedia or Agoda or one of these other services. So they're much more willing to negotiate with you, especially if you're going to stay for a few days. Yeah, you can also go in and say, hey, you know, I, you just took me, uh, this room seems nice, but it's across the street from a mosque where the call to prayer is going to be at five in the morning. And this place up the street just offered me this much for a room. Can you give me a deal in a better room? So it's you can literally bargain for hotels, for example. And that is that was taken as normal when I was a young traveler. And like you say, it, it's less likely. It, it's uh, These booking apps have made everything more convenient, but it's also sort of taken out some options and some savings. Right. And also... For whatever reason, booking transportation online is still quite a crapshoot because a lot of train train information is incorrect. A lot of bus lines aren't online still, <laughs> or they have a very 
rudimentary website. So a lot of times you just kind of have to show up and look around and see what your options are. And sometimes you find a lot better option than you even knew what was av- knew that was available. Yeah, I, I feel like oftentimes I say, I feel like a codger when I say it, but put your smartphone down and just be where you are because there's so many benefits. And one of them is ask around for 15 minutes at the train station, you know, um, that basically your local place is going to be smarter than your app, you know, that your app is optimized for convenience. And that's great. And convenience is a nice thing to have on the road. But if you give yourself time, there's just there's just so much it's just so much more of a multipolar experience in a given place when you're just walking around and asking and being patient. Yeah. And it's, it's funny. I have people ask me all the time what apps I use for figuring out where to eat when I go. And I almost never use anything like that. I just ask people, you know, because someone who lives there is going to know what's a good place to eat for a reasonable price, much better than Yelp or Chowhound is going to. Yeah. I remember when, when Twitter first came around, I, I, I told people, yeah, just don't worry. People were sort of enamored with the idea of crowdsourcing rec- restaurant recommendations. And they sort of got angry when I said that it wasn't really necessary and I had done fine without it. Um, because really, find a place that's full of local people. You know, in a, in a restaurant, you don't need the app because you can walk up the street and see where, where people are going who live there. Right, and they're not uh, trying to game the app either. <laughs> they're just eating there because they like it. <laughs> yeah, another another thing that happened this winter is that I was I was looking for some food in um, Bukatingi, which is a place in Sumatra, and I I found some recommendations online. I found this place called the the Turret Cafe in Bukatingi, and it it had the di- the dish that I wanted, and so I walked there through this market full of food stalls and and and, and Sumatran people. Right, I showed mm-hmm. up I showed up to the Turret Cafe. I was the only person there, and so they sort of had to open the kitchen and, and serve me and. Um, it it wasn't that great. You know, basically I'd walked through this market where everybody in town was eating to eat at the place that had been recommended by TripAdvisor. <laughs> That's a great story. And probably none of those stalls have a website or a Facebook page or any way they could even be l- listed on those apps. Precisely. Yeah. So I, I think that in addition to going to cheap parts of the world, going to cheap parts of the world and slowing down is just a great combination for just being able to stretch that hypothetical $10,000 so far. So let's let's transition into specific locations. And it's funny that when I was looking through your book, it's actually, it's sort of in the order that I wanna talk about. So we'll, we'll save Europe for last because Europe is often where Americans instinctively go first. Um, and then I think sometimes as travelers, we all have the place where we cut our teeth. And for me, that was Asia and specifically Southeast Asia. And so in this new edition of the book, you recommend Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, Nepal, and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and so how did, you, how, did you end up, how did you land on these particular destinations? Well, some of them have been on the backpacker circuit forever. And even, you know, 25 years ago, they were pretty well equipped <laughs> for uh, backpackers or budget travelers to get around places like Thailand. Um, even Lao, but Malaysia for sure. Uh, those were fairly easy to get around way back then. India was, you know, has been full of backpackers since the Beatles days, and Nepal, of course, because of the trekking and and all the outdoor activities, they've always been well set up. Well, since they opened to tourism, which is you know decades ago, they've been well set up. And then Cambodia sort of played catch up and caught up in a hurry. <laughs> you could sort of say the same for Lao too where um, maybe there weren't so many people going there at the beginning, but since the, because of their proximity, it was just a matter of time before they would start getting, um, what would you call it, the overflow, I guess. So now there's this pretty well-established circuit through all of those countries where you can get around fairly easily, get from place to place easily. The roads have gotten much better, especially in Cambodia. So I feel like that's a good part of the world for people to start because uh, the there's a lot of different options that you can do without getting on a plane. And there's a lot of places you can go that are quite reasonable. And then even when you do have to hop on a plane to go from, let's say, Bangkok to Kathmandu, it's not going to cost you much, especially these days with all the budget airlines that are out there competing on those routes. So a lot of people will just go backpack around Asia for a year and then come home. And it's very easy to do that and still have lots and lots of variety and still end up with places you didn't make it to. Uh, So 
I think Asia lends itself to budget travel, whether you're on a vacation or you're on a long-term backpacking trip, because it is so easy and the prices are so uniformly good. There's some spots in there, of course, like Singapore and Japan and Korea, where you're going to spend a lot more. But for that, for a big chunk of the map, you can get by very cheaply and see just some amazing, stupendous sites and and have some great ac- adventure activities at your fingertips. Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, Thailand is sort of my my doorway for that part of the world. Is, do you think Thailand is is a pretty common starting point, or would, are there other ones where you would recommend starting for that part of the world? Well, I think it is just because flights to Bangkok tend to be a pretty good deal. That's kind of the the crossroads of Asia, I guess. And so you can usually find a pretty reasonable flight to there. But also, it's just a place, good place to get business done. You can just go hang out for a few days and get your visas in order and get the rest of your tickets sorted out. And uh, it's a good place to go shopping <laughs> so people return to it, you know, to buy new clothes or whatever. Uh, so I think it's just a good um, good crossroads kind of place. I, I know a lot of people end up going through there three or four times on their trip just because they end up uh, back there before they go somewhere else. Yeah, it's it's where I ended up uh, uh, writing Vagabonding. I just got a room and, and wrote my book because I was really comfortable there. And, you know, the first time I went to Southeast Asia, I flew into Bangkok with this with this very detailed plan of where I was going to spend the next six months that include island hopping through Indonesia and going to Malaysia. And as it turned out, I spent six months in Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam and felt like I, I was rushed in a certain sense. And, in fact, I didn't get to Indonesia until... 2019 till this year, uh, and I absolutely loved uh, what I saw in Indonesia, and it, it was worth the wait. But I really do think that if you go slow and if you're saving money, it's not like you're going to run out of things to do in these sorts of places. No, and you could spend a year just in Nepal and India and not see everything if you wanted. These are sizable countries. Indonesia is huge. There's a lot of islands there. <laughs> so I've been there twice and spent, I think, a month each time would have spent longer, but the visas are always kind of restrictive. But I only saw a fraction of it. I mean, there's so much you can do in that part of the world. Yeah, I, I spent a month on one island on Sumatra in Indonesia this winter, and I was just talking to a friend yesterday, and she's here, oh, yeah, I spent all this time in Aceh up north. And it's like, yeah, I didn't get up north in Sumatra. So <laughs> I, I mean, one month I saw a part of Sumatra. Uh, and so it just goes to show, um, you know, I think sometimes we have this consumer mentality that's sort of a bucket list mentality that's based on what we already know about a place. But once you get there, then, you know, the the sky's the limit. So in this part of the world, what would you say a a fair monthly budget is for a place like Thailand or Indonesia or or even India, which feels like it's maybe the cheapest of all? Yeah, I think for India and Nepal, you can spend less than in the rest. And part of the time you run into t- the temptation problem <laughs> you know there's a lot you can do as far as uh, adventure activities and you know you can go get a massage for five dollars so you start thinking hey i'm gonna get one every day <laughs> but um i think for my sort of general rule with this whole book is fifty dollars a day for a single eighty dollars for a couple to to travel in relative comfort, but of course that's going to get you a whole lot more in India than it is going to get you in um, parts of Europe. So uh, I think probably for Southeast Asia in general, you can lower that a little bit, maybe um, 30 or 40 a day for a single person and maybe 60 or 75 for a, a couple. Usually a couple can travel cheaper than a single person just because you're sharing a room, you're sharing taxis, sometimes you're sharing food. Uh, so it just works out to be less, but, um, yeah, it, it, it all depends on how you travel too, how much discomfort you're willing to put up with, uh, how fast you're moving. We already talked about that, but that drives up the daily cost quite a bit. And then how much you're doing is in, in terms of those big bucket list things. I mean, if you go to Borobudur and Prambanan in Indonesia, I think they're each 25 or $30 a day a person these days. So something like that kind of blows the budget in a hurry. But then if you go hang out on a beach for a week, all you're doing is snorkeling and buying your meals. And so you're going to spend a lot less. So people figure that out over time. (laughs) If they're over for a while, they figure out how to go under for a while. And it's sort of that urban rural divide or the beach versus the city. You can always find ways to get back on track with your budget. 
And you mentioned Borobudur. That's that's a, a old an old city, right? That's old ruins. Yeah, in Indonesia, and Prambanan is um, very close by. One is Borobudur is Buddhist, and Prambanan is Hindu, and they're very impressive places. But it's sort of the area is cash cow, and they're making the most of it. And and you also run into this in a lot of places around the world where it's crowd control too. We've gotten to this point where they're we're having this serious over tourism discussion when you're talking about the Taj Mahal or Machu Picchu or Borobudur or Angkor Wat. And so they're sort of raising prices because they can, but they're also doing it to try to keep the numbers manageable. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why really giving, giving yourself more time is, is really your secret weapon in these parts of the world. Even if you have a year to spend just like not going to, to East Africa or Australia, if you're in Asia and just spending the year there, because then in addition to being able to see Boro Bordur, you also have that hammock time. And it's easy to forget, like it's such a pleasurable, sitting on a beach, a hammock and doing not much is sort of what people dream about, but then they forget to make time for that in their itineraries. Yeah, people picture their dream vacation lying in a hammock on a beach reading a book. And and then, yeah, people get out there on the road, they're moving around so fast, they are, they're not even doing that. So uh, it's good to take some time to do nothing and have nothing planned. Yeah, and you know, of course, we're talking about a part of the world that is that is uh, that's actually quite big, and we, we've mentioned we've thrown a lot of countries out there and a lot of sites out there. So, you know, keeping in mind that people might think of beaches when they think of Thailand or Angkor Wat when they come to Cambodia. What are some sort of counterintuitive sites in South and Southeast Asia where they might invest their time but might not know about now? Yeah, this is one of those cases again where it's good to just kind of have your antenna up and be listening to other people because you'll often find about find out about discoveries that you did, didn't even consider didn't even know about and you may alter your itinerary because of it and end up with having a lot more rich experience in the end than just ticking those main monuments off your list uh, and often it's not just about the monuments either or the famous sites it's about uh the scenery or or just the vibe of the city and and it's it's hard for me to think of specific examples in in southeast asia but of course there's a lot more to see uh in in indonesia than bali <laughs> just to br bring an obvious example i mean bali is so overcrowded but then the rest of the country has so few people in it that you can really get away from it all quite easily and often what you really want to see is below the water you know you want to go snorkeling or you want to hike into the mountains above the water and see volcanoes broke breaking through the the morning mist and that is an experience that might live on in your mind far longer than the day you spend in Angkor Wat running around in a tuk-tuk sweating to death. <laughs> yeah, and again, we're not just talking about beautiful beaches and mountains. We're talking about places where you can stay in a clean and beautiful hotel for like 10 bucks a night, you know. Um, and so that's a good thing to remember. And, you know, when Vagabonding first came out, I was writing for some glossy magazines, and I feel like – I sort of failed them because they wanted me to recommend specific things. And basically my, what I tried to write was, you know, if you have the attitude and if you slow down and realize that, that you have the advantages, once you take out a lot of these middlemen, then um, you can find things that you never dreamed about before you left home. Yeah. Here's a great example close to home. Uh, in Mexico, there's Chichen Itza that's near Cancun and it, you know, always shows up on one of those wonders of the world list. But it just gets mobbed and, you know, there's so many people coming there on daytime excursions from those beach resorts. Whereas if you travel on to Merida and you go to uh, one called Ushmal, you know, maybe there's a handful of other people there when you arrive and maybe one tour bus will show up. And then there's one near Valladolid called Ekbalam that I've literally had a dozen people tell me, oh, we were the only people there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and oftentimes they're just as spectacular. I mean, there's incredible Mayan ruins all over the place in Mexico, but everybody knows about that one and goes to there. And there's just so much else to see. And this is true in uh, all through the Americas. There's so many great things. Even, even Belize has multiple Mayan ruin sites and most people never see them. They just go to the coastal areas and don't venture beyond. 
Yeah, weirdly enough, that made me think of, of Indonesia. Again, everybody goes to Bali because that's what they know about. But a lot of the same things from, from surfing to, you know, regional culture that you find in Bali, you can find in like three dozen different islands in Indonesia. And so I, I do want to get to Latin America in a second. But before we leave the Asian region, I was just sort of delighted that Kyrgyzstan made it. And I was in Kazakhstan earlier this year, and the Kazakhs sort of talked about – Kyrgyzstan with sort of this affection. It felt like it was sort of the Canada to to, um, to Kazakhstan's United States. How did it, how did Kyrgyzstan end up in the latest edition of World's Cheapest Destinations? Yeah, that's an interesting comparison you made because the capital of Kyrgyzstan has to be the most mellow capital city I've ever seen in my life. There's hardly any traffic. There's doesn't seem to be much crime. There's not much noise. It's just a really mellow place. And it's kind of weird because it's an ex-Soviet Union country. So you've got these, you know, very Soviet looking monuments around. But uh, I just was there a couple of years ago, almost two years exactly. I did a hiking trip in the mountains and toured around a little bit. And first of all, I was amazed at what a bargain it was. And the food was really good and really cheap. I, I took a food tour in Caracol that I'm thinking was $4. It was something wow. ridiculously cheap like that to go to four different spots and taste things. Uh, but uh, yeah, the other advantage it has over the other stands is you can get a visa on arrival. So it's quite easy to visit there. Some of these places like Uzbekistan have made you really jump through hoops for decades to go there. And um, it's almost impossible unless you're with some tour group to actually work out the logistics. Whereas Kyrgyzstan is really easy. You can book everything on your own. You can show up in town and find a hotel. Nobody's following you around. <laughs> and so, um, and unlike Turkmenistan, another one there, which is a very bizarre place. But um, so Kyrgyzstan is very easy to be a backpacker or a mid-range traveler and uh, get around. And and just the beauty there is is really incredible. The mountains are the most stunning I've seen outside of Nepal. It's just um, amazing scenery. So not easy to get to. You got to go through Turkey or China or Russia basically on a flight. But uh, once you get there, it's definitely a place worth hanging around for a while. Yeah. And for and for listeners, it's just worth going to the Wikipedia page or any online uh, resources for Kyrgyzstan because it's such a, a strange sounding country. It hardly has any vowels in its name, right? But um, Yeah, it's hard to spell, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. But then just just as far as beautiful hiking that would compare to in Nepal or Europe, um, that part of the world is amazing. And I, I can really see myself going to that part of the world more often in the future. One place that I have been quite a bit, a little less so than Asia, but it's a good starting point for Americans, is Latin America. You mentioned Guatemala, Mexico, uh, Honduras, Nicaragua, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Peru. Where, where do you think would be the first stepping stone besides Mexico, which is so close to the United States, uh, to get entree into that part of the world? Well, Guatemala has a whole lot packed into a pretty small area, and it's not very hard to get to either. It's the next country after Mexico. So I, I think that's a good place for people to start. It's also a good place to learn Spanish if you want to just hang out in Antigua for a week and um, be in a really beautiful old colonial city and you can get private one-on-one -on -one lessons for five or six dollars an hour. It's really a bargain. So um, it's a good place to you know, at least get to a rudimentary level of, of Spanish. But uh, you've got the Tikal ruins up north and then you've got um, – you can just go over the border to Honduras for the day if you want and go to Copan. So you've got the, the Mayan history there. But then Antigua is a, a beautiful old city. And then Lake Atitlan is not too far away, which is one of the most beautiful places on earth. One of those pretty lakes with volcanoes rising up beside it. And there's some great Mayan villages around where the women still dress in their traditional outfits, not because they're trying to pose for pictures, just because that's the way they always dress. And it's fairly easy to get around the country and prices are, are quite cheap. Once again, I stayed in a city there where I was in the nicest hotel in town because I was on a writing assignment and it was $45 a night. I mean, it wasn't the greatest place I've ever stayed in, but you know, what would you get for 45 a night? Not the, not the nicest place in town in your home country. That's for sure. And at the same time, there were backpacker places that were eight or $10 a night. So, um, it's quite a bargain in Guatemala. Uh, Panama is quite easy too. And it's, um, it's the, the hub for Copa Airlines, so it's 
it's kind of a crossroads to a lot of other places. So you can just do a stop over there, even if you don't want to stick around. And um, once again, really good infrastructure, easy to get around. Um, Honduras and Nicaragua are a little more dicey because of um, if you are somebody that's super worried about crime and safety, those are probably not the first places you want to go. But if you're a experienced travel that has your traveler that has your wits about you, um, they're fine. But Nicaragua, I kind of put in there with a note that I'm putting this hoping the situation gets better because they've they've kind of had a Venezuela kind of situation where someone's trying to become dictator for life. And there've been a lot of protests and, um, it's not a real happy place right now in terms of the populace. When I was in that part of the world and I, I include Northern South America, I was sort of on the instinct and this is about 15 years ago that it was, it made more sense to go to the, the more exotic tourist place than the capital city, like Guatemala city, you probably would skip in favor of Lake Atitlan. And for sure. And same thing in Honduras, you do not want to stick around either of those two big cities. When you hear about terrible crime stats in Honduras, that's where 95% of it's going on in those two largest cities. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, that's worth considering that sometimes through geography class, we know the capital city, but that doesn't mean it's the best place to go, or even the best place to start. Because I don't know that much about Lima, in part because I skipped it when I was there. I went straight to Cusco and just had a blast in Cusco. And maybe Lima is great, but I just my instincts were that my time was better invested up in the up in Cusco. Yeah, I agree. And and even in Asia, a lot of times you want to get out of the capital city after a few days after you've seen the sights and done your business, just because it's noisy and polluted and sprawling and all those kinds of things. You want to get to somewhere more manageable. Yeah. Well, we, we've talked a little bit about uh, Central America, but we also have in your book, you have Ecuador, Bolivia and Peru, um, which are all sort of connected up there in, in northern South America. What might be a strategy for uh, for traveling that part of the world? Keeping in mind that the Galapagos technically is in Ecuador, but it's a long ways off the coast and you're probably not going to save much money there. No, it's not a bargain. I would save that for when you're... Uh grandmother wants to take everyone on a multi-generational trip and you can uh, tag along it's it's very difficult to do the galapagos on a budget and and it's better to save that for when you've got a vacation budget and you're going there for specifically for that but the rest of ecuador is quite cheap and they use the dollar there so it's very easy to do the math uh but yeah mainland ecuador has plenty to see and it's lots of mountains volcanoes uh, there's a part of the Amazon jungle that's there. So there's a good good amount of variety. And, and again, you get those Andean people with their interesting local outfits. And so it's a joy to photograph as well. But yeah, Ecuador, Bolivia and Peru are all you know right next to each other. So a lot of backpackers have figured out that that's a good cluster to go to. I write a good bit about clusters because I think it's a smart strategy to even if you're going on vacation for a month, you can fly into one country travel to a couple others overland and either leave out of a different one or return to where you started. And it's not, not more expensive than just to go to one of them. So, um, yeah, Ecuador, Peru and Bolivia are all a bargain. Although of course in Peru, if you do spend all your time in Cusco and Machu Picchu, then you're going to be mingling with a lot of money tourists and prices do get higher there for some things like accommodation, uh, it's still quite cheap to go out and eat if you go where the locals go. But if you go where the tourists go, it's not so cheap. But once you get out of there, I went to this area called the Amazonas in Peru a few months ago, which is the far, far north. And um, we went to these amazing ruins and these cliffside tombs and this fantastic waterfall called Gokta Falls. And there's nobody around. I mean, even if you go to Coca Canyon, you'll see a few other tourists. But once you get out of that main drag that everybody's on, it, it gets much less crowded and much, much cheaper. Yeah. When I went to Cusco, I got a little bit sick because Cusco is really, it's above 10,000 feet. And, yeah, it is. <laughs> and, and so it almost feels like. And one fun strategy in this part of the world might be to go to Cusco, but spend a week there without going to Machu Picchu and just ask people where else you can go. I know there's Choque Quirao, there's some other um, old ruin areas that aren't 
as popular on Instagram that aren't on as many bucket lists simply because people don't know about them. And I think once you realize that Machu Picchu isn't the only amazing historical site in the country, then you'll just by staying in one place and asking questions, you'll have a whole new set of strategies for that part of the world. Yeah, and it would be great to go to a place like Pisac where everybody pours in on tour buses for the day trip and then they leave. If you were there at night, um, it would be a whole different experience. And it would be cool to hang out in a place like that for a few days and just soak up the atmosphere. Yeah. Well, it feels like each one of these regions could be its own podcast. But in the in the interest of time, um, again, there's a travel corollary here, you know, that uh, the more time you have, the more the, the deeper you can dig. Uh, but let's go on to Europe, which is which is sort of the instinctive place for Americans to go. I was an oddball. I, I started all my international travel in Asia. Um, but people often think of Western Europe, which is fantastic, but just cripplingly expensive. <laughs> and, um, you know, a lot of your destinations are in the east. You have Hungary, Slovakia, Romania, uh, Bulgaria, Albania, Montenegro, and Bosnia. Before we jump into those places, is there any place in the west or north of Europe or even the southwest that is semi-affordable? Uh, Portugal's still pretty affordable. I was there a few years ago. I think it's starting to tick up a little bit because their economy's gotten better. But I would say in Western Europe, that's probably the best bargain. And parts of Greece aren't too bad either if you stay away from um, the the islands that everybody goes to, like Santorini and Mykonos. And especially if you go maybe in the early fall where the weather's still nice, but all the summer crowds have all gone home. And maybe parts of Spain too uh, are still a pretty good deal. But yeah, it's tough to find a bargain in um, you know Belgium, Holland, France, you know, Italy, <laughs> the, the places where everybody's going. So uh, I, I would like to note though that I've added when I've added countries over the years. Um, it started off at 21, and now it's up to 26. Most of them I've added have been in Europe, which is kind of interesting. But it's more a matter of uh, they've sort of improved. Um, they've added better infrastructure and just made it easier for travelers. Right. Yeah, and you sort of have a cluster there, you know, um, Montenegro, Bosnia, Albania, Bulgaria, it feels like could be visited on one trip. And looking through your book, I was I was interested by how much wildlife and like mountain opportunities are there. So what would you recommend to somebody who might only associate that part of the world with the former Soviet Union or the war in the 1990s? Where would you have them start? Yeah, I was surprised how forested some of these places are. I, I, Romania and Bulgaria especially, there's fantastic hiking opportunities around there. And you can even do hut-to-hut hikes where there's an infrastructure set up where you can spend the night kind of the way you would in Switzerland with uh, <laughs> a fraction of the, the dollar amount, of course. Um, but yeah, I think if you're going to start, uh, I would go to Hungary, actually. That would probably be um, the easiest first place to start because Budapest is very well developed and it's a it's a happening tourist city. There's a lot of uh, river cruises coming through and that kind of thing. Where In the summer, it's kind of mayhem, actually, when all those boats are docked. So if you can avoid kind of the late June through August period, it's better. But uh Good food, good prices, good wine, and um, Hungary has a lot of nice other towns and cities to go to and a big lake called Lake Palaton that can all be gotten to in a few hours on a bus or a train. So it's a good place to tour around and and kind of um, visit a few different spots without having to, to spend overnight on a bus or a train. And then once you're there, you can easily get to any of these other places. They are all connected by bus and train systems. That's one of the great advantages of Europe. It's very easy to go from country to country. And um, you can travel on an overnight train and maybe cut out a night of lodging. Or if it's just a few hours away, you can just uh, hop on a bus and get there. Uh, Albania is on the list, and that's sort of a, a, a blank spot in my own travel experiences. Uh, is it affordable and safe, and what do you do in Albania? Yeah, it's super safe, actually. It's probably one of the safest ones on there. It was a sort of a weird communist dictatorship for a long time, and um, it feels like people are really uh, happy to be um, in control of their lives again, and there's a lot of entrepreneurial spirit there, a lot of business going on. Uh, but there's some things that are crazy cheap. You can go out to a cafe and get an exp- espresso for 25 cents, <laughs> the equivalent of. And um, 
you know, it's 20 year, 20 year of Euro cents, I think. So you see these guys just sitting at the cafe all day drinking these little cups and, and, uh, you can go out and get a meal for two or three dollars and, and be reasonably full. The, uh, big advantage there for Americans, speaking of slow travel, is you can spend a year there on a tourist visa. There are very few countries in the world that will allow that, but it was sort of a gift to America for helping out the, ethnic Albanians in Kosovo during the, huh. the Bosnian War and the Dayton Peace Accords. So you can just show up there if you have a U.S. passport and hang out for 360 days, I think it is. Or uh, So it's a great place if you're a digital nomad to just go stay for a while, especially if you're trying to leave the Schengen zone in Europe and then have your three months away and then go back. So uh, they have great beaches there and um, – the, the city of Tirana is pretty mellow. It's a nice place. It's not polluted or very crowded. And um, the countryside is gorgeous. A lot of good hiking there, too. All those Balkan countries actually have this trail going through all of them called the Via Dianarca, I think it is. And it goes all the way up to Slovenia. And so you could, if you wanted, you could go hiking for months. Or, or you, could wow. just do, you could just do pieces of it here and there and, and stay in villages and uh, just – gorgeous scenery and then there's whitewater rafting and all those kinds of things that go with the mountains you look at a map in albania it sort of has proximity to italy is there is there an italianness to its landscape a little bit and then there's a ferry that goes across to italy so it's an easy add-on or an easy getaway if you want to go back and forth yeah they share the same coastline so if you think of the uh oh i mean the same sea it's opposite sides of the adriatic so if you think of um the coast of Italy and what that looks like. There's a lot of similar feel in Albania, though they don't have quite the same historic uh, architecture. It's more of that concrete chaco block, <laughs> more modernistic building style, I guess, but uh, still quite beautiful. Could that be a strategy f for this kind of travel? Maybe start with sort of a dream trip to Italy or if you, uh, and then go to Albania or start in Vienna and some other places, maybe in Switzerland, and make your way to, to Hungary and then then uh, combine a more expensive journey with a cheaper one? Yeah, sure, of course. And yeah, maybe since um, a week in Italy could probably get you a month in Albania price-wise, maybe that's how you do it. Uh, spend a week in Italy and then go over to the Balkans for the rest. And I do want to put a little caveat in there that Croatia is pretty expensive too, but that's also a very popular spot. So maybe you can combine it with a Croatia trip also. Yeah, well, weirdly enough, Game of Thrones has, has sort of made certain parts of Croatia over-touristed. Yeah, Dubrovnik has gotten really crowded to the point where they've, they're stopping, um, they're limiting the number of cruise ships that can dock there in the summer now. Yeah, so that's almost a good strategy that you you know you subtract Game of Thrones, um, and and it's just this amazing <laughs> historical place, and there's amazing historical places all throughout that part of the world. Um, now, keeping in mind that uh, again, the slower you can travel, uh, the more you're going to save and the more you're going to experience. But we probably don't have time for a five hour podcast, so we should probably wrap it up pretty soon. Um, in addition to checking out your book, what would be a strategy for someone who's still wrapping their head around travel that sort of designs itself around these cheaper parts of the world? Well, I always say maybe try to figure out where you can get a uh, cheap flight and where you can travel on the ground pretty cheaply and then build your trip around that rather than saying, oh, I've always wanted to go to Venice and I need to go in July. <laughs> And planning your whole trip around that because the more variables you leave open, the much less expensive your trip is going to be. Your airfare is going to be less. Your, uh, you know, you can you can vary your seasons so that you're not there during the height of the tourist season and things like that. So, yeah, my first piece of advice is always try to be as flexible as possible and leave as many variables open as you can. But then also maybe look at those clusters where things are together and there are maybe a few countries you'd like to visit that are right next to each other. And one thing I did with this version of the book that I hadn't done before but probably should have is I put a little map at the beginning of each chapter to show where that country is in relation to others because – Americans are kind of geographically challenged anyway, but also it's 
it's hard for a lot of people to look at a map and figure out where Romania is and, and especially a place like Kyrgyzstan. So, you know, get out a globe or a world map or whatever and, and figure out the proximity and then maybe uh, figure out what's really important to you. I mean, some people really do care about where are the fantastic monuments that I can see or where can I find these old cities that are five or 600 years old that I can walk around in and take a step back in time. Whereas other people are maybe more focused on the food or they're more focused on the beaches or they want the cultural experience. So um, figure out what's really important to you, what your biggest priorities are. And especially if you're a couple, that's super important to get on the same page with or else you're going to be fighting a lot about what to do each day. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've been, you know, with with your wife and family and, and on your own, you've been doing this for 25 years. If you could narrow it down to one biggest reward of traveling this way, what do you reckon it would be? I just have incredible memories. I mean, of course, I have great photographs, but I have incredible memories in my mind of things I did with my wife and things I did with my family. And, um, I figure even if I died tomorrow, I would say I could say I lived a really full life and and used my money in a way that bought me experiences and not just more stuff. This has been Deviate with Rolf Potts. More about everything that was just mentioned, including links to the new edition of Tim Leffel's book, The World's Cheapest Destinations, can be found in the show notes at rolfpotts.com slash deviate. And as always, you can contact me with insights or questions at deviate at rolfpotts.com. This episode was produced by Justin Glow. Cedar Van Tassel does the theme music. Jan Futterman does the show notes. Thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in for future episodes of Deviate with Rolf Potts.